All right. It is six o'clock, so we will call to order uh, the January 11th meeting of the Capitola City Council. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Kaiser? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. All right. We'll move on to item three, which is presentations. Uh, we'll start with a proclamation honoring SoCal High School's football state championship. So this is exciting. Uh, we have a proclamation here. Uh, it states, SoCal High School was established in 1962 and proudly serves students in SoCal, Live Oak, and Capitola communities. The SoCal High, SoCal High Knights football team competes in the Pacific Coast Athletic League of the Central Coast section of the California Interscholastic Federation. The team, which is led by head coach Dwight Lowry, SoCal High alum and former NFL professional, shows their strength both on and off the field, boasting one of the highest academic eligibility rates in the state. The Knights advanced to the state championship in Pasadena on December 8th uh, against Darupa Hills uh, Spartans of Fontana, California. The SoCal High Knights football team made history, winning the game 28-7 and earning the first state football championship title in school and Santa Cruz County history. The administration, students, coaching staff, and players of SoCal High Knights football all deserve honor and recognition for this accomplishment. And I, Kristen Brown, mayor of the city of Capitola, do hereby recognize and honor the SoCal High Knights football team 2023 CIF California State Champions Division for AA. I don't believe there's anyone here to accept the proclamation. However, uh, everyone should know there is a parade celebrating the team uh, on Saturday starting at 11 a.m. It'll go through the village and end at the bandstand. So everyone, please do come out and uh, honor these young athletes for their incredible accomplishment. Congratulations. All right. Uh, we'll move on now to item 3B, a presentation on the history of Capitola's incorporation. Hello, uh, my name is Deborah Ostberg. I'm the curator at the uh, Capitola Historical Museum, and I want to talk a little bit about why we're celebrating a 75th anniversary. Um, start off with, of course, we weren't always Capitola. Uh, I did want to mention, of course, we were the homeland of the Aptos and Cayastaca people originally for probably 10, 15,000 years. Then SoCal Landing when the wharf was built by Heen. And uh, then you have Camp Capitola, which we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of its opening this year. And that's what my exhibit next this year is going to be about. And uh, then, of course, you had some changes later when Henry Allen Rispin came along. But what we're going to talk about tonight is 1949. Well, before we get to 49, we have to talk about 33. And that's important because that really is the precursor of why people had concerns about the condition of the city or the town, and they wanted it to become a city. Uh, that 1933 fire destroyed over two blocks of downtown uh, Capitola, and it uh, destroyed, as you can see, quite a number of uh, businesses, restaurants, and so forth. Um, and I like the quote that's down there. Uh, it was Carolyn Swift, but she really put it really nicely. The fear of economic disaster aimed Capitola in a whole new uh, blueprint for its future, and that was true. Uh, there were delays in putting out that fire, uh, trying to get the water going, and neighboring fire departments didn't get here as soon as they, you know, they wish they could have. And uh, so that really had a, a, an impact on people. Would you bring the microphone just a little bit closer? Maybe I need, yeah, not on my Stay with my own mic better. Yes, thank Thanks. you. Uh, some of the community concerns was, of course, needing their own uh, professional fire department, getting reliable water supply, and replacing an outdated 19th century sewer system. Uh, go on. But one thing they did not need uh, was uh, a police department because they did have at that time the Capitola Police Protection District that started in 1928. Uh, it did go till 1967, so that was in pretty you know good shape. But if we continue here, you'll see some of the other uh, issues led to an attempt at incorporation right after World War II. 
1946. This uh, photograph is wonderful because this is probably around 1945 to see how empty uh, the village looks. A little different than it does today. Uh, we can go on. I, I was told that a, an original attempt in 46 uh, ended because of petty squabbling. I don't know what all the squabbles were about. But then uh, shortly after that, there was some talk of maybe they could join Capitola with Soquel. Well, you see with the next slide, that didn't go very far with the completion in 1949 of the uh, highway, dividing the two communities. Uh, and of course, we wish the highway still looked that empty today. But, um, but uh, in 49, the third version of uh, what was the Capitol Improvement Club was developed. Uh, this one specifically for going for incorporation. And you can see the quote there. Um, if I can read from here, uh, Capitola would be well could well be the gem of the ocean cities, but to beautify, we must first have local control. Uh, we can only have that control, uh, the quality of new growth. Do you like weeds, a regrown lot? Do you like sometimes lighted globes hung on telephone poles, et cetera, et cetera? Now, that's interesting that they put out something like that, but they didn't mention the major three issues, fire, water, and sewer. Anyway, uh, but they were very successful. But the other issues they were also going for were uh, less taxes, uh, neighborhood improvements, street improvements especially, and savings hopefully on utilities. And of course, the number one issue, of course, was, was sewage, uh, what to do with it. And you can see the two different sides here. You've got one of the folks, you know, in favor that if we got incorporation, we would get a sewer system. But then you have one of the firefighters saying, well, you know, they've just uh, had the beach closed as a fear tactic to say that we won't get the sewer without incorporation. So that was the really uh, big issue. We can go to the next uh, slide here. Well, the first thing that had to be done was uh, gathering enough uh, signatures to get a uh, resolution to be voted on. And you see there they had to get 25% of the land values um, between the beach and the freeway and 41st and Park Avenue. Uh, by the way, uh, with that fire in 33, uh, one of the things that really made that uh, a very important issue is that business losses were at that time $150,000. In today's money, that would have been $3.5 million. So you can understand why people were very concerned about fire protection. Um, now, here is where the vote was taken, uh, took place on January 4th, 1949. The Capitola Ballroom and Beach Club is where uh, Esplanade Park is today. It was the site of the old Cap Hotel Capitola uh, back uh, maybe almost uh, 50 years before that. And the results of the vote. You had uh, 243 saying no, 297 saying yes. It was only a 54 vote uh, victory, but that gave us incorporation. And officially, if we were incorporated today, uh, 75 years ago, January, January 11th. But uh, there was controversy to begin with because supposedly the first and highest vote getter in that vote should have become mayor. Well, that was Brad McDonald, 27 year old co owner of Shadowbrook. But when the council first got together, they decided, and there were only five of them, uh, they voted for, let's see, was he 63? I can't see his, yeah, 63 year old Harlan Kessler. And Kessler, of course, voting for himself. Well, that sparked some controversy. Uh, people were not happy. Uh, in fact, there were protests that started. Um, people, I think about 350 people came to one of the meetings. They had like 75 protest letters sent in. Um, now, it could have gotten ugly, but fortunately it didn't. Remember, it's only 1949. Uh, and we're very fortunate that um, Harry Hooper, you see there, he's on the right in front of his real estate office, which, by the way, was one of those buildings burned in the 1933 fire. Uh, he was considered a real icon of town. He was the postmaster, of course, baseball star. And at the meeting, he uh, told people, pleading with them for harmony. He actually said, you know, we have legally you know, elected our mayor. And he described Kessler as a man who had worked 18 years for the betterment of the community and that people should... Uh, you know, accept that. And with uh, Harry Hooper saying that, everybody kind of backed down. There were a few people that were disgruntled uh, and, you know, left the meeting not happy. A few of them actually wrote letters to Kessler, who, by the way, was an insurance agent, and they canceled their policies with him. So that was uh, some of the revenge. Uh, but all in all, uh, it uh, was a peaceful transition. If you go to the next slide. 
And we established a city hall, the original one there on Lawn Way, 127 Monterey Avenue, uh, which you can still see today. It's a private home. Uh, then the city hall was moved behind the police station, and it didn't look like it was all that comfortable. And then fortunately, in 1977, we had our new facility built here on this site. Getting close. Uh, city government. Uh, I love this. Uh, you can't see all of it, but that little uh, thing on the bottom says, Councilman Squabble again in Capitola. Uh, <laughs> that's the quote. And I can't see the one across the top, but actually it was a nice one that uh, uh, Carolyn said, something like, well, if Capitola could get through this and you can you know, recover from anything. So uh, that's a real nice sentiment to think about, especially what's happened to us in, in recent years. So anyway, that's kind of a short history of our incorporation. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really exciting. Wow, that's an interesting history. Petty squabbles and <laughs> I'm so glad we don't have anything like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, thank you so much. Um, so we've done the SoCal High proclamation. We are, have had a presentation on our history of Capitola's incorporation. So now we will go to the proclamation honoring uh, Capitola's 75th anniversary. Uh, and it says, on the fourth day of January 1949, an election was held in Santa Cruz County where 301 of 579 total votes were cast in favor of incorporation of the city of Capitola. On the 11th day of January 1949, Frank M. Jordan, Secretary of State of the State of California, duly incorporated the city of Capitola as a municipal corporation. The city of Capitola will celebrate the 75th anniversary of its incorporation as a general law city of the state of California on January 11th, 2024. To commemorate the history of the community, a series of events, programs, and educational opportunities will be held by the city through the end of 2024. Extraordinary civic engagement is key to the city's long-term success and to preserving a small town character with a deep commitment to progress and inclusivity. The city's goals for the future are reflections of the values and lessons of the past and also represent the heart of the intention set out by the earliest founders and contributors to Capitola. I, Kristen Brown, mayor of the city of Capitola, do hereby proclaim January 11th, 2024 as the 75th anniversary of Capitola's incorporation and encourage all citizens of the city of Capitola to join the city council in celebration. That's very exciting. Yeah. Thank you. And for all those in attendance or anyone who wants to come down before the end of the meeting, there will be 75th anniversary cake later this evening. So looking forward to it. All right. It's going to rival the zoning code update cake, I hear. Uh, watch out. Huh? Gluten free. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to item four, uh, additional materials. Do we have additional materials? It looks like we received additional correspondence. Yes, one email was received relating to item 8C. The email was posted with the agenda packet, and the city council received a copy prior to tonight's meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, item five, oral communications by members of the public. This is a time for members of the public to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda, but within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. Uh, and you will have three minutes. Please state your name for the record if you would like it included in the minutes for tonight's meeting. Hi, my name is Goran Klapic. I'm an Army veteran. I have an issue here at uh, Jade Street Park, uh, Capitola, at the moment, sometimes. I see that uh, there are gang signs and graffiti garbage signs, graffiti is different. I'm from Europe, I know what a graffiti sign is because we had to guard them, the graffiti artists, so that they are not attacked by uh, gangs. What I'm saying is uh, when you walk into the men's restroom, you need to use the bathroom not for uh, painting something or you need to use it because you have to go to the bathroom. And it's, it's a shame that it's, uh, the lavatory, uh, the towel dispensary uh, has been uh, ripped off or the uh, bathroom uh, paper has been stolen and uh, thrown out uh, on the ground there. And I, that's all what I wanted to say. I don't want to make any problems, but uh, it's really bad. I have to uh, go to the bathroom there when I shoot my baskets. I'm retired since my army days. So uh, thank you very much for listening and God bless you all. Take care. 
Thank you. Hi, welcome. Well, hello. Happy New Year to everyone. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. I thought this meeting started at 7. I'm glad I was here and there was no traffic. So, you know, just to be clear, the, those flags with the corporate fringe, that's uh, of America, of California, of Capitola. That's a corporate situation. You know, it's my understanding that most of the people that are in peace officers, law enforcement, are swearing two different oaths to our Constitution where outside this building you'll have a California and U.S. flag that don't have the corporate pirate fringe on it. So it was great to be here for... Um, the presentation, you know, I wrote a lot of things down. Will Capitola recover from anything? Now, the people that lived here 10 to 15,000 years ago, they're gone. So um, it's been a, quite an interesting week in the city and county bureaucracies. Uh, the last time I spoke at the city of Santa Cruz was at 13 hours, 28 minutes. There was some pandemonium that kind of erupted soon after that. I had an opportunity to probably engage with at least 25 different officers because I was initially there at 12.30 in the afternoon. I spoke at after 2.30 in the morning. I did leave a couple times to take care of some personal business. So uh, I got a hats off for some really creative evil genius, what happened. You know, I also spoke with a lot of individuals that could have been daughters or sons, spouses, mothers or grandmothers. And after the shenanigans, I saw more than a dozen people just really burst into tears. And I, I don't know, I put my hands on a young man. I witnessed a young, petite, thick woman break a window. But they have cameras for that stuff. But there was another couple that were banging on the window, and I put my hand on that man. I said, you need to stop because this is going to escalate to something. People are going to get hurt. So I'll take your hand off me. And I was like... No, buddy, you need to stop. You need to do this. And one of the young leaders said, you got to take your hand off that guy. And I said, I will, but he's got to stop doing this because this is going to get ugly fast. You know, I've spoken here before about a really terrible example of peace officers that happened on June 28th, 2021, where there's an awful six-minute and 41-second video presentation that shows a terrible example of peace officers. And that still hasn't been remedies. And those were officers in the Santa Cruz Police Department. So I'm actually here, so I care. Wish I had some more time because the information about the wharf and what they wanted to do was really quite amazing. There was an older gentleman that had worked there for 40 years. And it seems like common sense isn't so common. You know, there's lawsuits going that they can't do a restructuring where only 5% of the 4,500 pilings are damaged. And if you just added to that, you would add sheer strength to it. But several people talked about a lawsuit thank from you, stopping them from fixing it. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Any further public comment this evening? All right. With that, we will close public comment. We'll move on to item six, staff and city council comments. Does staff have any comments this evening? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I have a few updates on traffic safety around the city that I wanted to share with you this evening. The first, that next Tuesday, January 16th, from 6 to 8, we'll be holding a virtual public meeting for the Park Avenue Traffic Calming Study. This is aimed at reducing vehicle speeds and increasing particularly bike safety from um, Monterey to Coronado. Uh, this project's been outstanding. I believe the last time I came to council was November of 2022. Um, Everyone in the adjacent neighborhoods was mailed a postcard last week, and we've received multiple um, survey responses. The survey is posted on the website, as is the Zoom link to the meeting next Tuesday. Um, also going on around town is final striping of Capitola Road. It's uh, ideal to wait a couple weeks after you pave a road to stripe it so it adheres appropriately, and then it rained, and then it was Christmas, and now we're striping it. Um, at the same time, we're having the striper go around and hit a few other areas around town. He already striped the Crossroads um, crossroads Loop Crosswalk on Bay Avenue, um, also dealt with some odd striping up Kennedy, and then is also going to do some striping on Stockton Bridge for the bike lane. And then lastly, the flashing Bay Hill stop signs were ordered and arrived at our yard this week and should be installed late next week. That is all I have on traffic safety for this evening. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, is it possible for staff to um, send the information about the virtual public meeting to council members so that we can share that on our own social media and in other newsletters or however we might be communicating with the public? Absolutely, first thing tomorrow. Great, thank you. All right. Uh, any other staff comments? No? Okay, uh, we'll bring it back to council comments. We'll start down at this side. Any council comments? None? Down here? No? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just wanted to say Happy New Year, and we're all back here again, which is great. And uh, once again, you know, we were hit with some tumultuous weather, and just a huge shout out to Public Works and our PD for the quick cleanup, the safety measures that you all take, and it's it doesn't go unnoticed. So I just want you guys to know that we're all super grateful for all of your hard work. And I noticed the bike lane striping today on Capitola, and it's like super bright and noticeable. So it looks good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, and I just want to say briefly, uh, I already mentioned the parade tomorrow for uh, celebrating the, uh, thank you, Saturday, <laughs> not tomorrow, uh, to celebrate the state champion SoCal High Nights, uh, 11 a.m. in Capitola Village, rain or shine, see you there. Uh, and then I wanted to share that this evening, uh, I will be adjourning tonight's meeting in honor of Jerry Bowles, who recently passed away Jerry was a Brookville Terrace resident and was instrumental in the purchase of the park by the residents in 1973 to make them a, a resident-owned park. He served the wider county as a strong advocate for mobile home parks. Uh, he was a founding member of an organization uh, uh, of the organization called Resident-Owned Parks, and he served three counties uh, as well on the ECHO Board of Directors, the Educational Community for HOAs. Brookville Terrace held a clubhouse dedication for Jerry last week, which I attended along with our former mayor, Stephanie Harlan, uh, and Stephanie, uh, excuse me, several friends and residents, including uh, former mayor Harlan, uh, shared their fond memories of Jerry, who will be greatly missed by his community. So I will be adjourning tonight's meeting in Jerry's honor. Okay, we will move on now to item seven, which is our consent agenda. Uh, these will all be enacted on uh, by one motion. Uh, as listed on our agenda. I believe uh, we don't need to, it was public comment for this was included in the initial public comment period, so we will entertain a motion. I can move the consent. Second. We have a motion and a second. We don't need to do roll call anymore, right? We can just do voice, voice votes. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we'll move on to our general government and public hearings, and we'll start with item 8A, which is an update on the December 2023 winter storm event. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, as an in cap to our year here at the city, we had another storm event that we'd like to update you on. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so, like many storm events, we knew this one was coming ahead of time. Uh, we had high swell on December 28th, 2023. That was a Thursday. It was a high wave event uh, leading to storm surges. It affected the village and the low-lying areas along SoCal Creek. And the police department issued an evacuation warning, though there was no evacuation needed for this event. Next slide, please. Um, some proactive measures, some lessons learned from uh, our January 2023 storms was really issuing these evacuation warnings in a timely manner um, to coordinate effectively between public works and police early on. Uh, the police department was very much involved in the OR3 meetings ahead of the event and public works was very much prepared for the oncoming event days ahead of time. Um, pre event uh, preparation, active monitoring to mitigate potential damages, and then also public awareness, really putting out on our social media, and then also, forgive me, I am not in the police, but the uh, warning system that we have was also utilized for this uh, event. Nixle, thank you. Um, during the event, the response included community updates, um, the police uh, department continuing to be involved in incident command with OR3, closing the village to vehicle and pedestrian traffic and really being able to evacuate the vehicles that were already there, um, issuing the shelter in place during the event and providing those social media updates. Uh, Public Works was out there also in the wee hours of Thursday morning, um, trying to manage water levels, uh, protecting our esplanade and preparing for cleanup. And then after the event, uh, building department um, 
staff was out doing building inspections, damage assessment, and issuing uh, yellow and red tags to affected businesses and residences. Um, the closure and cleanup lasted for approximately 48 hours. We anticipated another event on the 30th that luckily didn't really materialize, um, but really it was helpful for Public Works to effectively clean up having the road closed for that amount of time. And also really for public safety, because sometimes the public cannot protect themselves, we have to protect them. And so keeping the road closed is really helpful uh, for, that, for that purpose. Um, as far as damage assessment goes, private damage assessment, there were four uh, yellow tags issued, three commercial and one residential. Currently, there is one, uh, two outstanding yellow tags, one at the Bay Bar, um, mostly due to not having access to assess the damages. And then another residential in the Venetian had to do with a window that they are actively repairing. Uh, two red tags were issued and are still outstanding for two residential units uh, directly adjacent to each other in the Venetian. Those were damaged in January 2023 and are in the building permit process, which will now also need to include these uh, additional damages. Uh, city property damages were limited this time. I would say a lot due to there being a whole lot less debris coming out of our creek and from the ocean during this event. Uh, wharf damages were a few structural elements, a couple of piles were damaged by some floating debris, and there was some decking loss um, in the under construction portion of the wharf. Uh, the estimate for those repairs were six to eight additional weeks for that project. And then we had the complete loss of the bottom of Hooper stairway that we had just rebuilt this past spring. And so we are considering a betterment project for reconstruction of this uh, in the future, probably a concrete structure, but we're gonna look into several alternatives to keep us from having to do this because this is not the first or second or third time that we have lost the end of the stairway. Um, the fiscal impact, um, so Director Hurley and I went out with OR3 earlier this week to do some damage assessment and reporting. Um, they are seeking state disaster conduct declarations to make us eligible for state and federal funds uh, countywide. Um, costs that we could potentially recover are preparation in response to the storm, the wharf repairs, and then also Hooper stairs. Next slide, please. Um, some lessons learned from this event for future events. Uh, we plan on putting out our mobile sign um, ahead of the events. Like I said, at the beginning of the presentation, a lot of times we have several days notice of these events happening. So we would proactively put out our changeable message sign at Esplanade Stockton Avenue, warning of um, high surf advisories. And then also during the event, having signage on our bollards, which block the entrance to the Esplanade, really trying to deter pedestrians from coming out there. Again, trying to protect the public uh, proactively. Next slide, please. That is it, I'm here, and so is Chief Daly, if you have any particular questions about this event. Great, thank you. Um, council, questions? Start at this end. Questions? Yes, well, I'd like to start at the stairs, the Hooper stairs. You know, the, we've historically have had problems over and over, and we're getting ready to do our cliff project too, right? Cliff restoration, cliff drive. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do just a temporary removable portion of the stairs until we get and do it, and probably the best would be concrete, but probably would be better when we did the restoration with the cliff drive. Just a yes. thought. That's definitely your consideration. Yes. Questions? Yes, go ahead. Um, I, I want to echo what our council member Kaiser said earlier about just the tremendous work that took place that, that day. Um, my questions are regarding a safety plan. Um, there were a lot of things we learned the first time it happened, and now we learned a little bit more. And I'm curious whether staff and our police department are going to work on a 72, 48, 24 hour plan when um, events like this occur again. Um, and if that could be presented to council. Um, and then this, and I know that's a bit of direction, but I'm just wondering if the, it exists already, I guess is my more direct question. Um, so the idea at this point is, is for specifically like a weather event, um, OR3 will give us some notice of that. And so when we um, have that first meeting, we'll have an idea how far out whatever event that we are going to have. And so once we have that first meeting, we're going to try and 
um, put in enough public notice. So at this point, when we looked, whether it be like 72 hours in advance of like whatever the storm is. And so there's a lot of variables, especially with weather patterns. And so as it builds up or increases or decreases in, as our vulnerabilities, um, but we do plan on putting out that the flashing um, mobile sign and then doing more proactive noticing on the front end, like I said, like 72 hours, 48 hours, and we'll build up. But like I said, having an actual visual sign at the at entrance of Esplanade, just giving people a heads up that are just like pedestrians or the business owners or those that don't follow social media and stuff like that. So that's the idea at this point. Okay. Um, so, and I can give further direction when we get to that that point, but the question remains, do we have a safety plan, a plan for our public works department? It sounds like the answer is there's no formal plan at this at this time. Um, this, the second part is about um, communication with council members. Um, we didn't receive any information until, because you guys were very busy, I understand that. Is there an opportunity for council to receive information um, when the OR3 information goes out. Um, and the reason I ask is because I know New Brighton Middle School opened up as a, as a, a shelter, um, but we didn't know about that. And us as electeds could use that information while the event's happening. And I appreciate the information you gave us, the updates after, um, but we wanna act as resources too. And I think it would be really great to be on those, um, be on some sort of communication line. Um, so those were somewhat of, questions slash comments, but thank you. Thank you. Okay, I just have uh, two quick questions. The wharf damages, was that damage to new construction, existing infrastructure, or both? Both. Okay. Is there anything, I, I, my concern is that if that was damage of new construction, then is it just going to continue to get damaged every year? The idea is that, that this was a resiliency project so that the new construction would make the wharf more resilient, but if it's taking on the same kind of damage as the old infrastructure, then is it really becoming more resilient? So there's two parts to answer. Some of that damage was because it was actively under construction, so that portion wasn't complete, it wasn't completely affixed, and so that is part of the reason it was removed. We do get that same kind of wave action in that... Um, area often. There are mitigations in the project to kind of address that with some of our decking, spacing, and other other items in the structure to address that. I would say once it's complete, and we are considering some modifications, but I would say the majority of the damage taken on of the new part, the newly constructed part, was because the construction wasn't complete. Okay. Uh, but, but a couple points I would add is, is that we have a wood piling wharf, at least all the old pilings are wood, and, and they will break in storms. I mean, it, it's just a fact of life that those wood pilings do break. And part of this project, you'll recall, was going from the three pilings during, we call it the trestle, sort of the walkway out to the main part of the wharf. And when we used to get breaks there, often the wharf wouldn't be structurally sound and we would have to close it and do emergency repairs. When the project is done, we're gonna be six pilings wide, which adds a lot of redundancy so that hopefully we can lose a piling or two and we don't have to do an emergency repair and sort of be kind of on the hook to quickly fix it. So in a sense, we are always gonna probably see some pilings break. I know the city of Santa Cruz sees pilings break in high storm events, but the goal here now is, is that we have more redundancy, it's stronger, and then if they do break, we don't have to be under the gun to get it done as quickly and we can maybe bundle the projects and do a more cost-effective way. Great, thank you. Uh, and then my only other question, uh, you talked about how OR3 is seeking disaster declarations for financial assistance and cost recovery. How long do we expect that financial assistance and cost recovery is going to take? Well, we, we just got our first checks for last winter's storms. I think it was in the last week. So that was about a year. Um, if it was on the same timeline, that's probably a reasonable estimate. I do know that that's actually relatively quick in FEMA land. Yeah. Uh, I think that the county is still struggling on getting some of their CZU fire reimbursements. Uh, all right. Great. Thank you so much. Um, no additional questions? Okay. We'll take it to public comment. Is there any uh, member of the public that has any comments on this item? Welcome back. Thank you. My name is Bill. James Van Whitney. So... With the repairs and storm surges, you know, you look at this picture right there, and I would suppose that that bridge is probably 
Probably only 16 feet above the creek. Um, it's my understanding being in the supervisor's meeting that the Capitola Pier, the walkway is 19 feet above the average of the ocean where the city is, the main wharf is 23. So although I don't think it went through, they were suggesting widening the wharf a little bit because then that was an opportunity to have an emergency repair area to make something that was brand new and only 5% of the 4,500 piers that have been there 100 years were damaged. Um, so maybe something possibly similar could happen with a repair here. So I thought this was interesting about the storm. I wrote this down. We knew it was coming ahead of time. You know, it seems sometimes common sense isn't so common. Uh, it's my understanding that the wave actions on the planet are caused by our interactions with the gravity of the moon. So why wouldn't other situations with the sun or other planets cause other different types of actions? It's my understanding that we may be dealing with tidal situations that are seven to ten times higher than normal this October of 2024. And this is due to alignments between Earth and our Sun and four other planets that some say haven't been identical to this within a degree since 79 AD. A lot of interesting things in history that happened in 79 AD. So I have a little bit of time. I just wonder with this damage if something couldn't be done that actually looked nice and if there was some kind of forward warning. You know, two human beings can pretty much easily lift up 100-pound sheets of, let's say, inch and an eighth plywood to protect the storefronts, to protect the buildings. And then there'd be a lot less damage. So the whole situation of we knew it was coming ahead of time, it's just going to be interesting to what happens because there's a lot of folks that really focus on astronomy and astrology and plan events, according to that. Anyway, interesting conversations. We'll see what happens with the drones. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Any further public comment? Okay, we will close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. Any comments? Uh, no, we don't need a vote. This is just an update. So we'll bring it back for discussion. Yeah, I, I would just like to see um, some sort of storm plan created just in case, Jessica, you might not be here on storm day, that person two in line can pull something out and say, you know, at a 72 hour, we start putting the bollards up and at 48 hours, we tell our businesses they have to close down if the waves are above, what was it, projected 33 feet or, you know, I just feel like we know these events are going to happen more often than we'd like and it would be a great idea to work with our police department, public works, OR3, um, in creating a Capitola storm plan for events that may occur in the future. Um, and it was just really, and, and it's partially also because of the information we received about the public being out there by the waves. We saw so many people out there and it was not safe. We saw one get washed out at the Venetian. Um, so I think it's just really important for us to take some sort of um, control over the matter, um, especially for the safety of our community and our businesses. I'd like to add to that. I, I think the police department has done a fair job of uh, notifying us and letting us know of, of these events. However, I think it'd be a good idea to bolster it because we have a reoccur uh, reoccurring thing happening where we have these wave events more often. I think it's going to be something that's going to be continuing to happen. So it would be great if we could bolster our safety plans. Yeah, I want to second that. And I, I think the ideas of having signage where our bollards are would be helpful. I know our PD that ends up having to stand there gets bombarded with questions from pedestrians <laughs> and they're not awesome questions. Um, so I would like to mitigate that if possible. Um, and then the Hooper stairs, I would definitely like to see some more permanent set up, whether it's concrete or something removable. I don't know what that would take, but just um, I think that's important for just our people that come to visit and everybody that lo loves to spend time over there. Um, and yes, I think the communication thing, 
I, I felt like this, it was a weird timing for this event. And like everybody was sort of like out of town or like not here and everybody was kind of scattered. So I felt like there was a little lack of that, but as much as we can do in that regard, I think will be super helpful. And, and as much as you guys help us, we want to help you too. And so the more we know and the more understanding we have of what's happening, the more we can put out there. So we're not calling or texting people that we know in the city to be like, what should I be doing right now? <laughs> what example should I set? So I think that's important, but I, overall, I'm really happy that everything kind of ended up okay. <laughs> I say that now, but you know, um, but yeah, thank you guys for all the work too. Um, yeah, I'll just say, you know, for better or for worse, this wasn't our first rodeo. So um, I was impressed with the preparations and the recovery, the how quickly the village was reopened. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot to say for our city staff, our public works, our police department, the group of community volunteers who worked uh, to help those businesses get reopened so quickly. Just really a great community effort, um, which is not a surprise to me at all that our community always comes together when we need to. Um, those two Venetians that are still red tagged, um, do we know if there's any support that we can provide to them in terms of how, you know, they, I know in the past, like SBA has provided some small, you know, loans to people who are experiencing disasters. Is there just any resources that we can provide or have provided to um, those residents? So Director Hurley he is actually online right now. And so she may have a better answer. I will do my best. And it, Katie, if you want to jump on and add anything, I think these were two structures were damaged last year as well. Um, and so I think they have been working through. I don't know how much they're going to be able to get from FEMA because they do have insurance. Um, and I do know that our building department has been working with them. But Katie, if you have anything to add online, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll let that answer stand. And I'll be happy to provide any more information in the Friday update. Uh, as I learn it. Yeah, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Um, I don't know. If, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So the SBA was here and the small and so there may be the um, ability for them to get low interest loans. So we will communicate with them. And David Reed is going to keep us uh, from OR3 up to date on what what options are out there for them. So great. Thank you. Thank you. I also just want to say, I actually really think that this idea of sort of a checklist for these kinds of events is actually a great idea. It's interesting, over my career here, we have primarily focused on water coming from the mountains. Um, that has been my experience, is what I've experienced in the past, and really we're always actively monitoring the creek. And now seeing two wave events, what's interesting about them is, is you do have a lot of lead time. You know, the wave forecasts are out there a week ahead of time, and so... I do think that putting that as sort of an addendum to our emergency operations plan, like with the wave events, so that you're not inventing it as you go, or if it happens on December 26th, you know, when a lot of people are out of town. Um, so I, I actually really like that idea. And the idea behind that sort of our post-event post kind of briefing was like, okay, you know, let's think about this, like having some high wave event signs that we just have already in stock, ready to go because our officers do spend a lot of time and it's hard to keep everybody off the Esplanade, right? It's a porous spot. So trying to do what we can, so it's just, it's not so much inventing the wheel uh, for these kinds of events, because these kinds of events, they look pretty similar, right? The same units were damaged both times. And so uh, I think that that's a great suggestion and we'll definitely pursue it. Great. All right, well, this was just an update. Uh, there's no vote. So we will move on to item 8B. Uh, receive a presentation regarding the new unmanned aircraft system drone program. Right. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here this evening to um, have my team do a presentation regarding our new um, unmanned uh, air aircraft systems there or drone program and so um, right now I have uh, Sergeant Kilroy I mean Sergeant uh, Newton who's been um, has been one of the uh, he's a pilot now but he's been one of the, the officers that helped kind of bring this program together and then Captain Kilroy is going to also follow up and he's going to be our, our our coordinator for the program so they've put the presentation together 
have put a lot of time and energy in looking at the policies and procedures and stuff like that and have done a lot of work and um, started bringing this team together. And so, like I said, I'm really excited to bring this uh, program forward and give you a little uh, overview of kind of what's going on with it. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Newton, and he'll, uh, he'll take it from there. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So the purpose of the drone program is to enhance officer and public safety with industry standard aerial support um, to assist allied agencies when appropriate, collaborate with other city departments to enhance employee safety and efficiency. <clears throat> this, uh, with the city departments, kind of like our, our, our big focus point and where we're going to get the most utilization out of this program. And what that would look like is in public works with our recent weather events, uh, getting a different vantage point for our city employees to effectively um, tack on these uh, weather events. Um, on top of public works would be also our re re uh, recreation department with our junior lifeguards in Camp Capitola. Um, make sure our beach goers and um, our juveniles are safe. Um, and then also community development with our building and planning department. Um, giving them different vantage points with our drone program, um, making them safe so they can effectively do their job. Um, so we see a big purpose with being able to use this for other departments in our city uh, for those various reasons. Next slide. While researching it, um, Captain Killer and myself, we uh, located three different um, common concerns that communities with new implementation of drone programs, and that includes safety, privacy, and lack of transparency. Going over safety concerns that we uh, identified is um, common one would be drones can pose safety risks, including crashing or malfunctioning, potentially causing personal harm or property damage. Um, there's actually been very few documented incidences of injuries from drone use not related to operator error. Our operators are trained FAA Part 107 remote pilots, and there'll be also monthly training in accordance with CBT training plan, which myself and Captain Corey will be uh, developing here in the next few months. Uh, drones could be weaponized against the public. That's been a common uh, theme that we've seen, but the FAA regulations prohibit attachments of weapons to drones for civilian or law enforcement use. Next slide, please. Uh, another one will be privacy concerns, capturing images and video footage of people in private places. Absent exigent circumstance or a warrant, our policy prohibits the intentional recording of images at any location where a person would have reasonable expectation of privacy. Routine patrols of high crime areas or even entire cities such as Santa Cruz County. Routine patrols are prohibited, prohibited by policy. And also drones could be used to conduct warrantless surveillance. Policy prohibits random surveillance, and camera is only in use during authorized operations. And lastly, transparency concerns. Capitol Police Department will not fully be transparent about our drone program, including policies, procedures, extent of drone usage, performance, and results. Our UAS program policy directive and usage reports will be posted to the public transparency webpage. Transparency may lack key details such as drone capabilities, including thermal imaging. Drone usage will be included in annual AP Assembly Bill 481 reporting, which will include all key details such as drone capabilities, including camera and thermal imaging. There are more than 1,400 police departments in the United States utilizing a drone program with great success. The key to success is a balancing, or is it, the key to success is a balance between the potential benefits and the protection of individual rights and privacy through clear regulations and oversight. Capitol PD will not operate, or will only operate drones within policy and directives. New technology will be inevitably arise that can increase public safety, but will also come with additional privacy concerns. We are committed to partnerships with the community to ensure new technology does not violate reasonable privacy concerns. And going into a little bit more deep dive in our policy and procedures, I'd like to introduce Captain Kilroy. Good evening, Mayor and Council. You guys see me okay, or should I find a platform? <laughs> All right, um, just to go over our policy and procedure, um, the purpose obviously is to promote a safe and efficient lawful use of any UAS um, within our control. 
And we want to ensure safety in all operations, and that's safety for the public, uh, for property, for first responders, and for our own equipment. Next slide. Um, some definitions that you'll see if you look at our policy and directive. Program coordinator, um, this is the position that I hold. Uh, it is appointed by the chief of police. Uh, the responsibilities include managing the UAS program and ensuring compliance with all regulations, training, safety, and data management. Uh, a remote pilot is a person that's actually exercising control over the UAS, so that's the pilot that's in charge of the controller itself and doing the flying. A visual observer is a person responsible for the visual observation of UAS in flight. So if we do have a visual observer, this will be somebody who is not flying the aircraft, but is watching the aircraft, looking for any danger and helping the pilot mitigate any issues that might arise. FAA 14 CFR Part 107, commonly called Part 107. Um, this is required for individuals to operate a UAS commercially, so being on the clock and being paid and it ensures knowledge and skills um, meet FAA regulations. So this is a certification that's issued by the FAA for remote pilots. Next slide, please. So prohibited use. Um, these uh, pieces of equipment will not be used for random surveillance. We won't be doing any kind of profiling, harassment, and they will not be used for personal use. Next slide. So some authorized missions will include, but are not limited to, um, crime and collision scene documentation. This would give us uh, an aerial view of either of these as needed. Response to hazardous material incident. This would allow us to get in closer to any sort of hazardous material spills to evaluate without putting personnel in danger. Public safety and life preservation missions. Um, this could include water issues, missing persons, et cetera. Actually, we have missing persons on there, but any potential um, hazards uh, to life. Disaster response and recovery efforts, uh, kind of self-explanatory. Allied agency requests, including fire, surrounding law enforcement agencies, we will assist with uh, authorization. Any missions related to in-progress crimes, training, uh, creating recruitment or social media related content and collaborating with other city departments. Next slide, please. So our mission operations, a general mission, um, as we're flying, the camera will be focused only on mission relevant areas. Uh, the UAS will only be operated by certified remote pilots. And again, those are um, those of us that have successfully uh, passed training and received our part 107 certification. All PD mission flight telemetry will be recorded to a software platform that we are going to be using called DroneSense. Um, however, we won't um, necessarily record all the data for uh, training or demonstration flights. Next slide. If we have pre-planned mission requests, uh, this will have to come through either the program coordinator, which would be me, or Captain Ryan, the chief, if needed. Um, and this. Uh, would be something if you think along the lines of a, a planned um, search warrant or something like that is what this would be covered under. An ongoing fresh investigation would be not considered pre-planned. On-duty active mission authorization. So something that happens while our pilots are on duty. Um, the UAS can be deployed, I'm sorry, on duty and actually responding to a call. Um, the UAS can be deployed during active and emergency incidents. And if that is the case, the remote pilot will notify their watch commander or supervisor. Indoor operations, this will be limited to emergencies or with supervisor approval. Uh, they'll be performed under the same standards as the on-duty active mission that we covered on the previous slide. And just so you know, when flown indoors, um, drones do not fall under FAA regulations because you're no longer operating in FAA airspace. For training, um, the, our training sessions will be scheduled um, by the program coordinator or appointee. Uh, we will establish a monthly hours requirement, and these trainings may be self-directed as long as they fall within the designated training plan. And training flights will be considered pre-authorized. So if an officer knows that he needs to meet his training for the month, he has pre-authorization to do said training. Next slide. So. Addressing data, civil rights issues, and privacy. Um, data retention and processing. Recorded mission data will be evaluated for evidentiary value. We're not gonna keep something that's not deemed valuable as evidence. 
Evidence will follow departmental data retention requirements. Those are laid out in policy. And evidence transferred to physical, or any usable evidence will be transferred to either physical storage media and or evidence.com, which is a cloud-based evidence um, database that we use. Protection of privacy and privacy concerns. So civil rights and privacy are always going to be protected and all operations will be consistent with local, state, and federal law. Next slide. So I do have one proposed policy edit um, that was brought to our attention. So under section 613.4, describing the program coordinator. So the change would be what's underlined in the second bullet point um, to read, the program coordinator will ensure that the policies and procedures conform to current laws, regulations, and best practices as, as outlined in the U.S. Operating Procedures Directive, and then to continue on um, with additional responsibilities. Next slide. So just a reminder, the purpose of our policy and procedures, to ensure the safe, efficient, and lawful operation of UAS, uh, prioritize safety and all missions, allow only trained personnel to utilize our UAS, allow support of first responders in various scenarios, focus on mission specific tasks while adhering to FAA regulations. Uh, we will be defining roles and responsibilities of all of our UAS flight crew members. We'll emphasize the importance of safety checks prior to any flight and address data retention, privacy and weather considerations prior to flight. And we will also establish flight time limitations to ensure the well-being of our flight crew. We don't want anybody who's fatigued going hands-on with any of our equipment. Next slide. So I'll just give you a brief overview of the equipment um, that we are going to start the program with. So we will be utilizing um, DJI drones. Uh, DJI has a very high reputation of quality while being fiscally responsible, to put it lightly. Um, so for our exterior flights, we uh, outdoor flights, uh, our plan is to use the DJI Mavic 3T, which has thermal imaging capability. Interior will utilize the model Avada, and for training um, and interior backup flights, we'll use, it's called a Mini 2. So here's what the Mavic 3 looks like, and gives uh, just a brief example of what that thermal imaging looks like. So our primary use for that will be on the interior. It'll give us about a 45 minute flight time. And it does have a 56 times hybrid zoom camera along with the thermal camera. The Avada, um, it uh, will be used for indoors. Like I said before, we can get about 18 minutes of flight time out of it. It's got a wide angle of view, first person view um, goggles to utilize indoor um, searches. Next slide, and then here's the Mini 2. As you can see, when they're folded up, they're about the size of the palm of my hand. Um, they're, they're very small. Um, and so these will be our training zones. They're inexpensive, so if there's damage done there, it, it's not a, a hard pill to swallow to, to have a replacement purchased. And we can use them um, as backup interior drones. They have a little bit longer flight time, uh, but the camera capabilities are, are a little less. Next slide. So our funding um, to launch this program, uh, we are using the Supplemental Law Enforcement Services Fund. Our initial budget from that fund is $15,000. Uh, that will cover the initial equipment purchase, training for four additional remote pilots, um, training for two program coordinators, that's Sergeant Newton and I, and then training for two program trainers to make sure that all of our pilots are up to speed on training. That will also be Sergeant Newton and I. And then we may request periodically funding through our Public Safety Foundation with approval from the Chief of Police um, to supplement training and equipment needs. Next slide. So our first collaborative uh, effort with the City Manager's Office was a video where Sergeant Noon and I captured um, some footage and Chloe was kind enough to put a very nice video together celebrating Capitola's 75th anniversary.
<laughs> so that concludes our presentation. I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. I love the happy Capitola reference. That's never going to get old. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, any questions on this side? I have a whole suite of questions. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd just like to start because um, I am going to ask a lot of questions uh, by saying this is great technology. I think it can really enhance the safety of police officers and our community at large. Um, I just wanted to preface my questions by that. <laughs> but um, I want to know first, can the drones be used for real-time facial recognition or automated license plate readers? No. No, they cannot. Okay. They cannot. Um, and then I had a question on the bullet point that said that the mission flight telemetry recorded on drone sense software. Could you tell me a little bit about drone sense um, and what, what the purpose of that is and if it's uh, available to the public? Sure. Um, I'll answer that in a, from, from last to first. It, it is not available to the public. It's a law enforcement um, UAS management platform. Um, drone sense is the name of the company. And uh, like I said, it's a, it's a management platform. It integrates with the controllers of the drones. It records flight telemetry. So it, it not only records um, speed, um, direction of heading, elevation, but it actually tracks the flight on a map, um, makes a record of it, uh, flight time, et cetera. And uh, all of that data is stored within the drone sense platform and it allows us to pull periodic reports that we can then post to the transparency page to show uh, what our law enforcement missions were why and we can add notes what was the reason for the flight what did we observe was any evidence collected due to that flight etc it also um, the drone sense platform helps us manage the equipment um, helps us manage training uh, it, it keeps track of every single every single pilot when they log into the drone. Um, that data of that flight is assigned to that pilot, um, so it just allows for pretty in-depth tracking of each flight, the pilot, the mission, and the equipment. Great. And um, if a drone is launched in the air, if somebody's flying it, is that video content automatically being recorded, or? Do you have to press a special button to start recording? You have to you have to press the record button to start recording, and you also have to stop recording when you're done. Yep. And within our directive, we 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 will not start recording until <clears throat> excuse me we've identified mission specific events that would qualify for recording. Okay, great, great. Um, and that kind of goes into the next question, which was about um, recorded mission data will be evaluated or evidentiary value. So you only really hang on to specific segments of that recorded video content. So an calls. overall, the way that we would want to do it, um, if, if we were to get a call for um, a drone to, to assist with an investigation or, or a call in, you know, in progress, we'd launch the drone, we would identify a, a potential um, area that needed to be recorded, we'd start recording. We record for the duration of that flight. Once it's done, um, we would then assess whether what we collected is of evidentiary value to that case. It may not be. Um, at that point, it would be deleted off of the device. If it was uh, determined that it was valuable to the case, that entire recording would be kept as evidence. We don't. We yeah. We don't edit. We we can't do that. Right. It's it's one piece of evidence that would then be uploaded or saved in some fashion for that case. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I would just add that it sounds like the policy is designed around this, but I think drones should be used very sparingly. And I know that it's in your policy to use it for social media and training purposes. And I hope that um, the police department would just be cognizant of people's understanding of drones and that most people do not want to see any drones, let alone police drones flying overhead. Yeah, because of privacy concerns. I understand that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on this end? No? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. We will bring it now to public comment. Are there any members of the public that have comment on this item? Welcome back. 
Sure, why not? My name is still James Ewing Whitman. I, I, I wish that uh, all peace officer organizations had the best technology available. That doesn't seem like the best technology available. I watch TV, I watch videos. Um, I think some of the questions brought up by the, the council were good. Will this be used for facial recognition or license plate readers? Probably not. You know, they, that's a redundancy. Um, the city of Santa Cruz disclosed what the county is doing. You know, every intersection from downtown Santa Cruz past State Park Drive has, uh, is getting upgraded in 27 different um, intersections. So those, the facial recognition, that infrared stuff, it's rampant. It's everywhere. Your Apple phone does that every seven seconds. Um, you know, the whole six feet away, six feet under, whatever. This might have some $100 bills. It definitely has some cards in it. Satellite can read that if I'm five feet away from another human being. That's technology that's 30 years old. So there's a lot of things going on, and I could go into quite a bit of detail about that, but I'm all for peace officers having the best things to keep the peace, and hopefully they'll get even better equipment than they seem to have already. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Any additional public comments? Seeing none, we'll close public comment and bring it back to council for uh, additional discussion and... Uh, additional discussion. Any further comments? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. It was really informative. And thank you, Councilmember Peterson, for your questions as well. Those are really helpful. As part of the prohibited use on the policy um, 613.6, you make note of um, that prohibited use is to include to target a person based solely on um, actual perceived characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my hope would be that this particular additional policy is intertwined with the implicit bias trainings that all police officers um, are required to do in the department. Um, you know, you're trained on implicit bias when you pull someone over or when you do et cetera, et cetera. Now we're introducing new technology and would be... Um, we, I don't know if it's a request in those trainings, if you have to add it on, or when you um, start using drones in, in your community. So I'd like to see um, that incorporated um, somehow into the implicit bias trainings that you have to do. Um, other than that, I'm happy to, um, to move the recommended, recommended action on um, this item. Let me get to it. Oh, well, then I don't give any... I withdraw. I withdraw my motion. <laughs> okay, sorry. I had a clarification on one of the earlier slides where I think it, and now I don't remember what slide it was, but do you mind bringing up, um, it was actually when Sergeant Newton was perfect. I saw your look of concern. Okay, thank you. I was like, yeah. it was about the yeah. common concerns. Yes. Amongst yeah. Them. Okay. So the, so that the, was the wording in, in there. Yeah. So it did it have something to do with the transparency and the yeah, CPD thank you. would yes, not thank be you. transparent? So the concern is that CPD would not be transparent. Okay. However, the solution to that is we are going to be gotcha. completely okay. transparent. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I thought. Yeah, I saw that. I saw the look it. pop up on your I, face. I, yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I have just a comment. Uh, I know our sheriff's office has been using it since 2019, and uh, it's worked out really well for them. I know the Capitol has asked for assistance for several times for the use of a drone, so really look forward to this technology. I know it's really good. Great to see you guys here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the presentation. Really appreciate it. We'll move on to item 8C, uh, provide direction to staff about remote participation options for members of the public at city council and planning commission meetings. I will go to staff for a presentation. Good evening, Mayor and city council yeah. members. There's no um, PowerPoint for this item. So just to briefly recap, on October 26th, during our regularly scheduled city council meeting, um, our city was targeted by what's called a Zoom bombing. And we received numerous comments um, via Zoom that included 
non-inclusive, hateful language. Following that meeting, the city council provided direction to staff to temporarily suspend Zoom public comments. Um, Zoom public comments are not required by law. It was something that the city had incorporated as a courtesy for residents. Since then, we have received public comment during city council meetings requesting that the city bring it back. So it is here tonight for city council discussion and direction back to staff. Uh, I prepared a survey of cities that have received Zoom bombings. It was included with the staff report and a copy was also printed for your review this evening. Um, approximately 65 different agencies, not always cities, sometimes school boards, have experienced Zoom bombing incidents in 2023. Some of those agencies have received multiple targeted experiences. Of those, about 38 of them, so about half, have temporarily or permanently suspended the use of Zoom for public comment during their meetings. So this is something that continues to be an issue um, throughout the state. I'm available for any questions, but this item tonight is really for an opportunity for you to discuss and deliberate and provide direction to staff. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll start with questions. Questions at this end? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, my thought is it would be great if we still kept it at least temporary, if, if not uh, more, but unt until things get better, until there's better technology for Zoom and identifying where, where the calls are coming from. Um, and, and looking at this list, it looks like that would be the appropriate thing to do to uh, continue until maybe the, uh, it changes a bit and gets a, bit, a little bit safer for everybody. For my own clarification, continue with allowing Zoom comments, Zoom comments or continue as it is right now? Revisit it later. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Year to year. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, questions? No? no questions? Okay. Questions on this end? We'll go to comments after public comment, but are there questions? Um, yeah, I had a question. I just want to um, clarify. Um, these, this is the most up-to-date list of dates, right? So there hasn't been anything since October. Is that correct? So I initially collected the survey data after our city council meeting. So this was collected in November. Um, I have not. Um, there have been multiple cities that have been hit multiple times. And so with so many cities removing Zoom as an option for public comment, sometimes that prevents it from happening again. So I can't say since December um, when the last time this, I think the last time I updated the spreadsheet was in late November. Um, Julia, have you reached out to the League of Cities to see if there's been any um, movements with the governor's office in regards to because we're allowed to have zoom and public comment that way have you have you gotten and received any updates from the league of cities so our city manager actually shared this spreadsheet with our representative from the league of cities i'm not sure because we're not required to have zoom as a public comment function it's a it's an option that we provided as a courtesy to residents to allow for further inclusivity. So there's no legal requirement for us to maintain Zoom as a public option. I'm not sure if the league has um, chosen to focus on this in this year as a, an option to review. So then my follow-up question would be for our attorney. Um, have there be, has there been any updates to the um, on the legal end of things we can do to, to protect ourselves or to stop the comment? as they come in? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, if there's no further questions from council, we will bring this uh, to the public for public comment. Welcome. Yes, my name is still James Ewing Whitman. That was October 26th, I was here. I listened to that. That actually was pretty ugly. There's a lot of ugly things going on now, which is quite the catch-22. Uh, I didn't know what this list meant, but I was looking at it before it started, and I'm like, wow, I'm so glad that we're bringing this up. So during the lockdown, there weren't a lot of public meetings. I remember showing up for the first time at the city of Santa Cruz, where seven of the 11 individuals had probably heard me speak 150 times in front of them, but zero times in the last two years. So if something else happens, how are we going to be able to communicate? And I'll say directly on Tuesday, I wasn't there the whole time, but I was at the city council. 
after showing up at the county at 8.30 in the morning, from 12.30 till about 4 in the morning. That's a long time. As I said, I was, my comments were at 13 hours, 28 minutes before the pandemonium. As far as controlling free speech, you know, I think that uh, Rowan Atchison, about 10 years ago, did a very important communication. He felt next to food and water, the next most important thing was free speech, more important than a roof over your head. So I left to take care of some work business, and I had a, you know, a nice speaker, remote, Bluetooth, state-of-the-art 2023 handheld weapon. That's a great Motorola tool. And it cut out on me like 30 times in less than an hour. And I don't know. I mean, I definitely went into a concrete building for a while, but it's very frustrating when the technology is not working. And I'm in disagreement that the Zoom and the surveillance stuff, they know exactly who's making those calls. You know, they're not sharing the technology. So as ugly as it was what I heard, um, I'll tell you flat out, to be in a room of over 100 people and to witness more than a dozen women just really burst into tears about their really evil genius of how they changed the plan for uh, calling for the ceasefire in Palestinian in Palestine, occupied Palestine. I'm not for a ceasefire, but I'm not talking about that right now. I'm, I'm here for accountability. And uh, if something else happens and we don't have access to communicate with you folks, you know, you should be responsible for what you say. I try to be careful with what I say. And I can actually thank Mr. Clark for giving me some good guidance. We had a laugh about that, and I still I thank you a lot for that. So it is important that people can communicate with you. And you guys seem to have pretty thick skin, not as thick as some other people maybe, but I think it's great that you guys have the skin of the thickness that you have. So I'm glad that I made time to be here today and because uh, this is going to be an outstanding year. And my understanding is there's a lot of censorship going on. And uh, I think people should be accountable for what they say, but they should be able to say it. Thanks. Thank you. Any further public comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council for uh, deliberation, and we'll start down at this end. Comments? Thank you. Yeah, I do have some comments. Um, I think that Zoom is a really important asset to our community. I think it helps um, our residents become more involved with local government, which is really important. I also think it creates an avenue for elderly and disabled to have access to the chambers in a convenient way. Because um, looking at this data, if the um, date of collection is correct at the end of November, that shows us that it's been approximately one month since there were really any incidents. There's only one incident in November being on November 1st. The rest happened in September and October. So based on that, I would suggest that we regather the information, the latest data, and revisit this. And if all of the incidents happened in September and October and there haven't been any recent in the past two and a half months or so, uh, I would recommend that we reopen Zoom for public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? You want me to come back? No. Um, I was just doing a quick search to see if there's been any, and I think that information would be helpful. I think my personal opinion is that we would wait to gather some more information from staff to see if there have been any more incidents, um, incidences occur. Um, my concern is just that with the issue I brought up with the attorney, that nothing's been done to protect our community or like, um, from hearing hate speech um, via Zoom. There's, there's no protections in place for, for anybody at this time. So um, I'd like just to see an update uh, maybe in February or March just to get, gather enough information and time. And I can do my own anecdotal research as well in the meantime as well. Thank you. Um, I agree that people shouldn't be silenced, and that is why we have other modes of communication within the council. Um, we receive emails quite frequently throughout the weeks, months, leading up to meetings. Um, it doesn't mean that those voices are not heard. Um, and if anybody, um, like Mr. Whitman stated, he was here that day that we got Zoom bombed, and 
it was horrific. And I don't think that anybody should ever be subjected to sit and listen to any type of hate speech whatsoever. Um, so that being said, I am totally welcome to some more current information as far as who is still receiving these types of um, calls. And um, quite frankly, it doesn't really matter where they're coming from. They're just, they shouldn't be allowed within these chambers personally. Um, so I'd like a little bit more information as far as um, if there's any more recent happenings and then if anything legally starts to come up for the safety and protection of those that are involved in the meetings that's good information too um so i'm fine to revisit in a couple months and just see sort of what the climate looks like then um and go from there thank you yes i'm in agreement with pretty much everybody um we do have to just wait to see what happens with the technology on um, zoom even though Zoom's a company and it's not a process, but it would be nice if we could move a little bit forward before we open it back up. Thank you. Great. Uh, so I have a, a couple thoughts, and I'll start by saying uh, that I agree with the idea of gathering additional information. Um, if we could find out not only, uh, you know, between now and let's say that we can revisit this in Q2, so the first meeting of March, um, if we could find out not only by then if any, Thing, changes in law in the legislature or anything in that regard. Also, if there have been any incidents since this last was um, looked at, but then also this, there's this list of what the cities have done, continuing to use Zoom, discontinued Zoom, or considering discontinuing Zoom. I'm assuming that was also in, in October. If we could get an update on that as well, how many cities have, have since decided to get rid of Zoom altogether, how many brought it back, I think that would also be helpful information. Um, so if we could bring that back in March, I'll say that um, hate speech while protected by the First Amendment is stressful and demoralizing and in some case frightening for people who are targeted by it. And I feel like if someone is emboldened to speak in such a way, then let them do it in person um, where they are identified and accountable for their actions rather than, you know, hiding behind the cloak of anonymity that, that uh, Zoom sometimes allow, I think. People are often willing to cater to their worst instincts when they feel that they are safe behind that kind of anonymity, and it's often seen in cyberbullying, on social media, in this case, Zoom, and call-in comments. Um, it's cowardly, but uh, people do have the right to say what they would like to say, and so while we certainly welcome and support free speech, I would encourage people to be accountable for what they choose to say by saying it in public when people know that it's them. Um, so with that, those are my comments. Do the staff have direction? Adequate yes. action. Okay. I did just want to state for the record um, one more time. I didn't mention this earlier, but the ways in which members of the public can currently comment on city council items. So obviously members of the public can appear in person during our meetings to comment. They can also email the city council um, prior to the meeting or even sometimes during the meeting before the item is heard and the comments will be made a part of the agenda packet and a part of the official record. Um, we often forget that this is a way that members of the public can comment, but they can always come and drop off handwritten notices to us or handwritten communications to us. We'll scan it and deliver it and make sure it's made a part of the record. Um, if a member of the public doesn't have the ability to write something down, they can dictate their comments to a staff member and a staff member will make sure that the comments are transcribed for the city council. Um, members of the public can also mail their comments. They'll be provided to the city council. And all of that information is available in our agenda packets on our website and in person at City Hall. So I just wanted to make sure that was in the record for ways that people can comment. Thank you, that's important information. I appreciate that. Uh, staff has direction, yes? One question. It would it be most productive, would, would the council like us to schedule this for a March hearing? One other option could be that we could update the spreadsheet distributed to the council in the form of a memorandum and that if anybody would like us to hold the hearing, whether it's in March, in April, in May, we can do that. I'm fine either way. Just the question is, is if the update basically looks the same as it does today, do you want to have the hearing? So I was trying to offer another option. I will say too, as cities decrease usage of Zoom, it does tend to decrease the number of Zoom attacks we have. <laughs> so that is a little bit of a correlation there. No, I would just like it to be agendized just yep. for transparency with our with our the public and our community. Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say um 
the the attacks or incidents were really difficult. It's probably the most difficult time in city council that I had. Um, it was frightening. It was terrible. I don't want to give a platform to this kind of hate speech, especially when we have so much, you know, so many terrible things going on in the world and I, more hate speech is the last thing that we need. Um, but I do just feel like if it's not going to be an issue, we should find that out as soon as possible. And we shouldn't let racist and hateful people take away privileges from our residents. So I would say if, if it, if it keeps happening, if it's something that is an issue, yeah, let's wait until it's not. But we should find out if it is. And then if it happens again, I would be fully in favor of removing Zoom again because I don't want to platform hate speech. Um, but I also don't want racists or Nazis or whatever they are to make it so um, somebody is inconvenienced on speaking their mind to us who may be you know, unable to get here in, in an easy way. Explain a little bit of my thoughts. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So I think staff has um, direction from council. So we will move on. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item 8D city council appointments to advisory bodies. Julia, is that you again? Back to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to close out this evening, um, tonight I do have a city council appointments to regional and city advisory bodies. Um, as you probably will recall, Capitol is represented on various multi-jurisdictional boards by members of the city council. These boards and committees are established by other codes or bylaws, not by the city, although city council members and sometimes staff members have seats on those boards to represent the city's interests. Um, in addition to those multi-jurisdictional seats, the city council holds seats on three of our city advisory bodies, the Financial Advisory Committee, the Commission on the Environment, and the Art and Cultural Commission. Um, in addition to that, there are four multi-jurisdictional groups to which the city council has seats on. However, the city is not the appointing body to those groups. The appointing body is the Santa Cruz County City Selection Committee. And so tonight for your review and consideration, we would like to review, affirm, and make appointments where necessary to the city's advisory groups, to the multi-jurisdictional advisory groups, and we'd also like to make recommendations for future city selection committee appointments so that when the city selection committee meets and has the opportunity to appoint somebody from Capitola to that group that we have a name kind of already drafted and ready for that meeting when it takes place. So to start us off, I thought I'd start us off with an easy one, is the city advisory bodies. So there are three, like I mentioned before, the Finance Advisory Committee, Commission on the Environment, and Art and Cultural Commission. The current 2023 appointees are listed on the screen here, and then there's a blank spot for the 2024 appointees. For the FAC, the bylaws state that the mayor and vice mayor are the appointed people unless they do not wish to serve, one of them or both of them do not wish to serve, in which case other members of the city council could be appointed. So um, I will wait for your guys' discussion and deliberation for this before we move on. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll start at the top with the FAC. I'd like to remain uh, uh, on the Finance Advisory Committee, and I'll turn to Vice Mayor to see, under bylaws, do you want to join or? I wish to join. All right. Sorry, Council Member Peterson. I know. Okay, 2024 appointees will be uh, myself and Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, Commission on the Environment, Council Member Kaiser. She'd like to remain. Uh, Council Member Clark, Art and Cultural Commission. I would love to stay on. All right, there we go. First three, done. Thank you. Um, our next option is for the multi-jurisdictional seats, and these are the ones that the City Council has the authority to appoint to. And so the first one is the Area Agency on Aging Advisory Council. The 2023 appointee was former council member Bertrand. The Advisory Council has requested a city council member be appointed. They do not want it to be a member of the public. It should be an elected official. Um, the Arts Council is the next group. The Art and Cultural Commission had appointed Roy Johnson to be the city's representative. So the city council just has to ratify that appointment. Um, Zone 5 Conservation District, currently it is Mayor Brown with um, Joe Clark as the alternate, and Library Financing Authority, also currently Mayor Brown with Councilmember Clark as the alternate. So I'll wait for your guys' discussion. All right, Area Agency on Aging Advisory Council. 
Any takers? Anyone interested? I'll be happy to serve. Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, Arts Council, I'm sorry, I, I was writing down some of what you were saying, but I missed. Did you say that Roy Johnson is so the main? The Art and Cultural Commission made the recommendation that uh, Roy Johnson should be appointed, so the council just has to affirm that appointment. Okay. I'm I spoke to Mr. Johnson, and he wants to continue. Great. And he very enthusiastic, so yeah, he'd be great to stand. Wonderful. We, we confirm that appointment remains? Great. My recommendation would be sort of take all the names down, take public comment, and then you can kind of vote on the whole slate at the end. Oh, are we voting on this? Okay, cool. Let's continue taking names. Uh, flood Control, Library Financing Authority, I'll remain on those. I'm happy to remain as the representatives. Uh, Councilmember Clark, are you okay with remaining as the alternate? I am. Okay. And that takes us to the last group, which is, again, the City Selection Committee is the appointing body to these, but when these meetings occur, it would be nice to have a pre-drafted recommendation so that at the City Selection Committee, um, you can just say the city has already prepared a recommendation for this. And I just wanted to go over the other groups that are listed on the screen. So 3CE Policy Board, we currently have Vice Mayor Brooks is the appointed person um, on Monterey Bay Air Resources. Can we, get the next, can we get the next slide? Oh, I'm so sorry. I had it on my screen, not on your guys's. Um, so 3CE Policy Board, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, MBARD is currently the Santa Cruz. It's a Santa Cruz seat and it rotates. So at the City Selection Committee meeting in January, they will make an appointment. We don't know yet if Capitola will be the next city that it rotates to. In the event that it is, it would be nice to have a recommendation ready for that appointment. The Remote Access Network Committee, that appointment was made in December. It is... Um, the mayor of the seat has to be on the group. So in this case, it'd be Mayor Brown. Um, and then LAFCO, currently Vice Mayor Brooks is our appointment. And that is also a rotating seat. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, 3CE? So, I was so 3CE, we're, we're on, and the term <laughs> expires next year, end of 24, and we rotate that with Scotts Valley. So you don't need to take any action on three. So the only one we really need a recommendation for is MBARD. The other ones we are set on for the time being. Yeah. So MBARD, it rotates around all the cities. And I know that Santa Cruz has it now. Their seat expired in December. So at the city selection meeting this month, they'll be making a new appointment. And we just don't know yet who it rotates to. I think we might be up, but it might be Watsonville. But at the city selection committee meeting, the way it works is basically the mayors choose. So if we have a nominee, if somebody is interested in Capitol City Council, um, Mayor Brown may be able to kind of push that name along. If nobody's interested, we could leave it for another city. Anyone interested? Interested? Okay. Uh, when the meeting comes up, I will find out if it's our turn and just generally mention that we have an interested council member. And uh, if it's our turn, I will... Put your name forward. Great. So those are all of the appointments for the regional and city groups. So we can go to public comment. Thank you. Uh, any public comment on this item? Yeah, my name is still James Ewing Whitman. I wish more members of the public were here. So far, I've been really polite. I will continue to be so. You may not like what I'm going to say, but listen to it anyway. So, you know, trying to filter through, find out where and what I've said, who actually censored me uh, on the 12th. That was a phone call. Um, you guys have meetings where you're meeting different groups. Maybe there are these mentioned. But what wasn't mentioned was any association with CalCog or ICLEI, or AMBAG, or the Community Foundation Santa Cruz. So I'm just making that statement. There's a lot of different things going on. I've already talked and given you guys information about the powers and weaknesses of being a charter city or county. And uh, I'm not saying you guys aren't being transparent. Those just four organizations came to mind, and they do have some control of this area. Um, anyway, it's just delightful to be here. It's a, 
2024 is supposed to be a pretty amazing year for reasons I would love to talk about, but I want to stay on topic. So I wish I would have added some stuff to my other comments, but I missed that opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Okay, uh, any further public comment? Seeing none, we will bring this back to the council. Uh, the agenda says review, affirm, and appoint. So do we need a vote on this? And a formal vote would be good? Okay. Uh, we will, uh, if there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion to approve or whatever the motion may be. I um, actually wanted to discuss. Okay, discussion. I was curious about the uh, AMBAG expiring in 2024. When would we discuss that? Next year. Oh, I'm sorry, 2024. Yeah, it's December of 2024. Oh, December of 2024. Yeah, yeah so that's the when end the, of this year. So yes. a year from now. Yeah, so next next January in the first meeting, uh, okay, 2025. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'll move to approve all of the recommendations. Okay. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. All right, that brings us to the end of our first meeting of 2024. Uh, we will adjourn to the next regularly scheduled city council meeting on January 25th at 6 p.m. In the meantime, all of you, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And we are adjourned.